Thank you, Dr. Sultani. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you all for, my, for our presentation on behavior of uh, unbonded post-tension precast concrete wall under lateral loading. So this project was part of a collaborative effort between University at Buffalo and University of Alabama, and it was sponsored by NSF. So uh, I was the PhD student on the, uh, on the research program, and Dr. Aledi from University of Alabama, and Dr. Okumas from University at Buffalo were the PIs of the project. So in the recent years, uh, there has been a concerted effort from going from just saving lives to saving buildings during earthquakes. So especially during 2011 earthquake in Christchurch uh, in New Zealand, which is considered to be one of the most advanced uh, country in terms of uh, seismic design. Uh, the number of casualties were largely reduced compared to previous earthquakes in the 1980s or before the thousands. But the number of buildings that had to be demolished and the recovery process was, you know, mostly termed as slow, painful, frustrating. So there is increased demand uh, from stakeholders to engineers like us that we develop uh, structural solutions so that we can minimize damage and reduce the functional downtime. So this is the major motivation behind our research work. So if you are designing a reinforced concrete building and if you are planning to use reinforced concrete concrete shear walls as your lateral force AC systems, then rocking wall could be an alternative. It has been studied since the 1990s and it has been proved to have uh, better cell centering capacity and reduced damage when compared to monolithic uh, reinforced concrete shear walls. In this slide, I'll try to make you understand the basic mechanism of uh, uh, such cell centering walls and distinguish it with monolithic cast and place traditional reinforced concrete walls. So first, uh, we can look at the middle figure. So the basic difference is that we have a, a wall panel that is not cast monolithically to the foundation. And they are, the wall and the foundation are clamped together using unbonded post tensing elements. These unbonded post tensing elements are designed to remain elastic uh, during an earthquake and hence when the seismic event is over. The elastic restoring force for the PD elements brings the wall panel back to its original position. But uh, as you can see in the figure below, uh, as the PD elements are designed to remain elastic and there is very little damage in the wall panel itself, the, uh, the energy dissipation capacity of such systems are low. So to complement, to supplement this sort of system with added energy dissipation, uh, researchers have identified and tested in laboratory different means and one of such means is shown in the figure or in the thought figure. Um, so one of those ideas is to provide milestone reinforcement across the foundation and wall interface. These milestone reinforcements are designed to yield very early during lateral loading and uh, they dissipate energy owing to their hysteretic uh, behavior and we result from the nonlinear elastic sort of behavior shown in bottom second figure to a uh, advanced flat set hysteresis loop as shown in the bottom top figure. And now because we have a single gap opening at the base of the wall as shown in both the second and third top figure, uh, we don't get flexible plastic hinging like in traditional cast in place monolithic walls. So what this does is we avoid damages typically associated with shear flexor interaction and also there's lower probability of rupture of uh, Longitudinal reinforcements, and because we don't have the stents and compression cycles uh, in the longitudinal reinforcement, we also reduce the chance of buffing. And most of the damages in uh, rocking walls that are concentrated at the rocking corners, uh, indicated by those couple of red lines. So, this figure is very effective in communicating how a uh, uh, reinforce, uh, sorry, a rocking shear wall performs during seismic loading. Uh, this is from uh, a test done in 2008 from University of California, San Diego. Um, and the wall they use as part of the lateral force resting system is hybrid wall, that is rocking wall with mild steel uh, reinforcement, as I just discussed earlier, as additional energy dissipating elements. So, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, this sort of wall system have been studied continuously since 1990 till present. 
but uh, uh, they have been limited to rectangular cross sections. And increasingly, uh, due to architectural demand, uh, the shear walls in current buildings are of non-rectangular shapes. So in, in our research activity, what we try to do is we try to bridge this knowledge gap in terms of non-rectangular rocking systems by performing a large-scale test of a T-shaped uh, rocking wall. So to design uh, our test specimen, what we did was we first designed a prototype T-wall specimen. For that, we took a four-story prototype building with the plan as shown in the figure here, and uh, we used ASC 716 value ladder force procedure to proportion uh, to uh, come up with the demand of the structure, and then we used to proportion our prototype wall. And then we uh, scaled it down uh, by the ratio of one to three, and that's how we got our test specimen. So we use standard five psi concrete and grade 60 reinforcements to design our specimen. So this is the plan view of the confined region of our uh, test specimen. The length along the uh, plans of the wall was 5 feet, and the length along the wave of the specimen was 6 feet. As you can see, uh, the corners in the plans and the wave were confined, and they made ACI 3819 uh, recommendations. And also, we use shear and longitudinal reinforcement to meet, meet ACI 319 recommendation. And, uh, and we have uh, force tensioning and energy dissipating reinforcement in the wall. I'm going to describe the location here. So, uh, in, for plants, we had two locations of uh, force tensioning uh, uh, reinforcement, and we put 1.6 inch strand heat in both the locations. And for the wave, we put a uh, total of 0.74 inch square of PDE reinforcement at the center region. And both uh, above the flange center and the wave center, we provided energy dissipating reinforcements, and they, these were provided externally. So typically, uh, these energy dissipating reinforcements are placed inside the wall panel as well. But if you put them outside, you can inspect it during the earthquake and replace if necessary uh, after a seismic event. So this is a schematic view of the wall panel. We used two wall panels of different height, and they were secured together using steel uh, steel channels. Uh, and you can also see the ducts there for uh, providing unwanted PD elements. And we also had steel sections in the bottom wall panel to uh, connect the energy dissipating reinforcement coming from the foundation to the wall panel. So in the next few photos, I'm going to show you the fabrication process in the laboratory. So this is the form of for our wall panels uh, for casting concrete. They were made, made from standard, standard plywood seating. And after the wall panels were cast, we assembled them together, as shown in the photo. So we used steel sections to secure them together. And this was when we inserted the PD strands into the wall panel. And after the wall panels were uh, put in their final disposition on top of the foundation block, uh, this is the process of putting the loading block on top of the wall panel. And this is the photograph of our final test setup. Uh, you know, so as you can see, the foundation block is post tensioned to the laboratory strong floor using six PD bars. And the foundation block, the wall panel, and the loading block were secured together through the post tensioning force as for the design of the T wall specimen. And this gives us a closer view of the loading uh, setup that we use. So we use two loading jack, uh, one each in the plant and whip uh, to load the specimen along the principal axis. And this figure shows the loading protocol that we applied on the wall specimen. We basically use quasi-static cyclic loading protocol uh, through loading in wave and plant direction. Uh, we started from 0.05% drift and we reached all the way to 1.5% drift. And at every alternate, alternate drift level, we combine the loading from wave and plant direction to obtain diagonal uh, direction loading as well. And we stopped at 1.5% drift because we had a fracture of uh, 
for some of the areas of disability enforcement after which the wall was in unstable condition and we could not carry uh, for the testing. So this is the video of uh, one of a portion of our testing. Here we are testing, I'm, I'm going to show the loading in 1% diagonal direction. And before I go ahead with uh, play the video, I just wanted to bring your attention to these two uh, white sort of blocks that you see. These are here just, uh, these are encasing of ultra high performance concrete, very stiff material so that we could restrain the buckling of the uh, Inducing spinning reinforcement. These are unbonded from the uh, casing block and do not affect the behavior of the bar itself. So, so you can look at either the top here or at the bottom rocking corners to appreciate the movement of the wall during testing. Okay, so, so moving on to the next slide, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about the damage that we saw while testing. There were numerous uh, hairline cracks resulting from laser and shear, but none of those uh, were considered concerning and could be easily repaired. And uh, as expected in rocking walls, the damage was limited to the rocking corners of the wall panel. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you the closer view of those uh, rocking corners. And uh, and even then, the damage was mostly limited to the wave result where we saw spalling of concrete, uh, covered concrete, but still the concrete that was inside the confinement was still intact. And this can uh, and this justifies why we did not see any strength degradation in our post dislocation response. So while we lifted the specimen up, we saw the damage in the center region of the flange rocking surface. And this is more attributed to the weight reduction loading when the flange region was in compression. And typically because we don't confine this reason during uh, for uh, traditional monolithic reinforced concrete walls. So maybe for rocking walls, uh, this requires additional attention as well. So now in the next few slides, I'm going to show the um, measured response from our testing. And this is uh, the force displacement response, meaning the force measured uh, from the jack and the displacement measured at the top of the wall. And drift means uh, the displacement measured at the top of the wall divided by the loading height. So uh, first, I'm going to just talk about the wave direction over here. And as you might have already noticed, because of the measure of uh, the distribution and T-cell itself in wave reduction loading, the response shall be unsymmetric. And whenever, so this, uh, for whenever I'm describing wave reduction loading, I'm going to refer to waving compression or transient compression phase, representing the direction of loading uh, of the specimen. And whenever the wave was in compression, the capacity was higher. It's because uh, the reinforcements in the plants are part of wave from the neural axis there. They contribute more to the lateral load carrying capacity of the wall. And whenever the plans was in compression, the capacity is slightly lower. Uh, it's because the reinforcement in the plans are closer to the middle axis there, and they do not uh, contribute as, as much to the lateral load carrying capacity of the wall. So this was expected. And uh, you can see there is no strength degradation except at the last cycle because of the rupture of the area reinforcement, which also again suggests that there was very limited damage in the concrete panel itself. So if you look at the flange reduction loading, again, the capacity is more slow than the weight reduction loading. This is expected because the width of the flange is lower and also the amount of reinforcement and the initial pre-stressing uh, in the PD strands, the flange was lower. And again, the, uh, the response is symmetric because about the flange centroid, uh, the distribution of reinforcement and the geometry of the wall panel itself is symmetric as well. So, when, uh, so in the next figure, I'm going to show you the residual drift uh, of observed from this specimen. Uh, by that, what I mean is uh, whenever we unload the specimen and there's zero load coming from each respective drift cycle, the wall will have some residual deformation. So, that is what I'm going to talk about in the next slide.
So as you can see, in both the cases, whether it be plant duration loading or weight duration loading, the residual drift was lower than 0.3%. And, and this is considered to be good for self-centering systems for drift PO and design drift. And in our case, the design drift was lower than 1%. And uh, in cases lower than 1%, the residual drift was lower than 0.20%. So which is sort of correlated with the uh, amount of drift in which you can uh, reoccupy your building if you are just looking at the performance of the wall itself, just the wall. So you need to again look at the other components as well, but if you are just deciding based on the performance of the wall, then it's enough to reoccupy the building after a seismic event. And uh, during early development phase of uh, rocking, uh, self-centering rocking walls, energy dissipation uh, was a concern, so ACI came up with a methodology to calculate the energy dissipating capacity and set a limit at uh, 0.125 for self-centering rocking wall systems and in both the loading duration we were able to, the specimen was able to exceed the prescribed limit. So now in the next few slides I'm going to talk about the bidirectional behavior, bidirectional behavior of the wall panel and uh, as you can see it's, it's a little difficult to get from this slide. So let me just isolate uh, the behavior of the wall in 1% drift load, 1% uh, diagonal drift loading. So I have uh, plotted the peak load obtained in plant direction in the y axis and peak load obtained in the wave direction in x axis. So first, let's just look about x axis. Both the data points uh, they are mirroring each other. That means uh, whether you push or pull it on the plant direction, the y direction response was not affected. But if you look at uh, look at symmetricity around the y-axis, uh, there's difference in behavior. So the easiest way to explain this is whenever we push the wall such that the wave was in compression, the flange was already lifted. So to push the flange further to reach our diagonal drift level, the flange offered low resistance. But in opposite case, whenever our flange was in compression uh, during the wave component loading, and we had to push the wave uh, push the flange further to get to our Desired diagonal drift loading, the flange would provide additional resistance. So uh, this can be further appreciated now looking at the comp complete result. For example, in weaving compression phase, uh, even though uh, the diagonal drift level keeps on increasing, the resistance on the flange side is still low. But on the other direction, whenever the flange is in compression, as we keep on increasing our diagonal drift level loading, uh, the resistance from the flange side keeps on increasing. So this is one uh, bidirectional behavior, uh, one of the aspects of bidirectional behavior that I wanted to bring to your notice. And uh, so the final conclusion uh, that I want to uh, say is similar to rectangular uh, rocking walls, PE rocking walls also have potential of, uh, you know, uh, activating high self-centering capacity and minimize damage. And thus, this should also be promoted in uh, newer designs and construction. So thank you. And here I have my contact details of my PIs. Uh, if you want to collaborate or ask questions, and I'm ready to take questions.